What am I, a gopher? Bacall, Bacalls, Bacalls, Lauren Bacalls. Welcome back to my corner of the internet. I'm so glad that you're here and welcome to a brand new year. I, oh crap, that rhymed. You know what, I'm gonna leave it in. I don't care. Stay hydrated, eat well, exercise, do all the things that I don't do, um, but that I tell you to do because you should take care of yourself. So I already made my worst books of 2022 because I had kind of finished um, pretty much everything I knew that I was going to rate pretty low, um, but I have not yet filmed my December wrap up because as of like 11.30 p.m. on December 31st, I was still reading, trying to finish a book just to have it done. I did end up finishing it, so it is now in my December wrap up. It is now January 3rd and I can finally film my December wrap up, so here we are. And I am going to just jump right in. Okay, so I, I don't even know how many I read in December. Let me count. 12 books in December. Um, part of the reason that, uh, to me, this is a pretty high count, um, but part of the reason is because some of them are middle grade books and so they were very, very quick. Almost every single book that I read was an audiobook except two. One was physical and one was an ebook. I met my good year, it's not a blimp, my good reads reading goal for 2022. Um, so that was 75 books and I managed to read 75. I was very excited. And then as of, um, cause I was like 86% of the way through my ebook. So by the end of December 31st, I finished my 76th book. So I was really happy about that. So what did I read in December? I started out with Blake Crouch's Upgrade. If you've seen my worst books of 2022, this appeared on there. It's hard though, because it's not, it wasn't a terrible book by any means. It was actually in the sci-fi section of the Goodreads um, sci-fi book of the year. Um, the reason that it was on my worst books list was simply because this is the first sci-fi book that I've read in a very, very long time. And it was the only sci-fi book that I read in 2022. So I kind of wanted to throw it in there and talk about it a little bit. It's about a, a man who works for a government agency that is rounding up genetic scientists and putting them away, um, unless they agree to work for the government and do only what the government says. Now, the reason that this is happening is because this is a near future, um, kind of a post-apocalypse in a way. So this guy's mother was probably the best genetic scientist in the world and she was very much um, an advocate for climate change and figuring out how to, uh, you know, continue the human race without destroying the earth because you can't have a human race without a planet for them to be on. In her misguided attempt to save the planet, she ended up causing a catastrophic food chain supply issue where crops were decimated and therefore livestock was decimated and therefore um, a huge part of the population starved to death. Um, and so the, the world is still dealing with the fallout from that. At some point during one of his raids where he's going after these scientists as kind of making amends for his mother's crimes, he gets blown up. An explosion goes off and he survives, but he has cuts all over his body and there was some sort of uh, bioterrorism element to the explosion. Um, he survives, it ends up upgrading his genetic code though. So he becomes the next evolution of a human. He's, his bones uh, increase in density, so he's way less prone to injury. Um, his reaction times physically are much faster. His processing speed is much greater. So it's almost like time slows because he's able to take in so much information so quickly and process it that it feels like, you know, the matrix where the bullet is just whizzing past and you're kind of watching it. So he's, he's an upgraded human who is now on the run from the same government agency that he worked for. Irony. 
So the book follows his being on the run, trying to figure out how and why he was upgraded and what to do with this. So plot points come out where it's basically theoretically up to him to save the earth. My actual issue is that I wanted more commentary on climate change, not just, hey, the world sucks now because we didn't deal with it. Like we get it, like of course, of course that's happening and that's going to continue to happen. But I was expecting a deeper conversation about it and the moral dilemma of when you're desperate, does it justify taking desperate action without fully understanding the ramifications of what that could lead to? It touched on that and it was, I thought it was gonna be the heart of the message of the story considering that's what set everything in motion. I didn't feel like it, it followed through enough with the commentary. So I was disappointed in the messaging that was touched on but not really fleshed out. Again, it was an enjoyable enough read. I actually rated it three stars. Um, it did read kind of like a cross between a sci-fi and an action novel because he is on the run and that is a big part of the story. So again, if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, I would say go for it. Um, I listened to it on audiobook. I kind of blazed through it and I thought it was a decent read. Okay, what was next? Ooh. I was just talking about this book last night. Okay, so the next book that I read was The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. The Devil in the White City, Murder, Magic, and Madness at the Fair that Changed America. In the Devil in the White City, you don't need the rest of the title. This is a split perspective of the architect who was tapped to basically mastermind the World Fair um, that came to Chicago and the first serial killer in America and they happened at the same time. And so it has the crossover perspectives. What was interesting about this is it could have easily been two completely separate books. And it, it, it honestly felt that way when reading it because you go from the perspective of the architect and why are they choosing Chicago and how is he going to basically build a city within a city within such a small period of time? Um, who is he gonna be able to get to do it? Uh, and then it has the story of America's first serial killer. Now this kind of feels like a true crime podcast or one of those true crime shows that you see on, uh, on cable TV where it's fictionalizing the in between the facts. So there are certain facts that are known, who he killed, how many people he killed to a degree. This, for the first serial killer in America has been sensationalized. There are people who say it's been hundreds of people. It was proven that he killed, you know, X number of people. And he was just, he was a con man. He was a very successful low grade con man, insurance fraud and uh, basically what today would be Craigslist schemes of somebody buying something and having it sold out from under them, that kind of thing. So 1893 was where the World's Fair came about. So we're talking late 1800s early 1900s as far as like the time period that you're you're set in i really enjoyed this i gave this four stars it was a very long book and it was basically reading two completely separate books because they really did not have much of a crossover chicago did draw thousands thousands and tens of thousands of people to it for the world's fair but there's really no proof that any of the people traveling to chicago for the world's fair specifically were any of his victims People had traveled to Chicago with the World's Fair kind of as this background thing, but you know, they were escaping, you know, a stifled family life or, you know, rural areas where there's no opportunities. Um, so it's this interesting split perspective. I personally found the architectural parts of the book wildly interesting. It's a book topic that I really, really enjoy even though I don't know much about architecture, but the architecture that it's talked about in books when you're talking about designing and building, I find fascinating. I could have had this as two completely separate books and been completely happy with both of them. So the fact that they were kind of intertwined because of this time period was really interesting. The serial killer parts were very well done. Take it with a grain of salt though, because the facts that are known are in the book but his actions that he never actually copped to. Um, he only took credit for two murders that he said were not murders, but they were surgical procedures gone bad, where he was helping these two women out. 
so the the author took some some fictional liberties about his take on what drove this person to be a serial killer there are different theories from different people um if you want a good explanation or a good recap of the first serial killer sticking just to the facts that are known i will link a video down below it's answers with joe is the youtube channel and he did a video on the hh holmes the world's world's america's first serial killer that he does kind of go through the known facts and kind of separates that from from, from some of the sensationalizing so interesting video really interesting book um i think it was it was well written it was well researched but understand that there are parts of it that like the motivations and the specific actions of this man that are fictionalized so eric larson's devil in the white city four star i would highly recommend it it is a chonker of a book though um i personally would recommend the audiobook i thought it was very very well done and that makes it easier to get through considering it is a pretty long read of course i had to take another call so sorry about that if it's janky All right, so the next book that I finished in December was All the Old Knives by Olin Steinhauer. This one you might have seen lately. I think it's on um, Amazon Prime Video. It's been advertised. It is starring Chris Pine and I don't, I don't know the actress's name. I know she was from Westworld, um, which I did not watch i watched like part of an episode um which is how i recognized her um but it's basically the story of two old spies um one just got out of the business and one is still in the business but not really actively in the field like he used to be and there was an uh the terrorist incident that happened years ago and they always suspected an inside person that was um leaking the information or um, who was involved in it in some way. And so the current spy, the man, uh, is trying to figure out that leak all these years later to finally put the issue to rest. And the only person that he has not interviewed is his old, um, not partner, but um, old spy colleague, uh, who is the female character. Now, they did have a romantic relationship throughout the book. They were stationed in the same area, in the same office, but they had different jobs. Um, and so he travels to her home in California. They meet for dinner to hash out what happened. And he is trying to figure out if she was the leak and she is trying to kind of survive the encounter when you have been in the spy business and you get out of the spy business you're always looking over your shoulder and so the story is just basically them over dinner but it's also told in flashbacks of the actual events as they were happening and so he is trying to eliminate her as a suspect and also pick her brain to see if there's any clues that she had unearthed and that can lead to figuring out who who done it. I enjoyed it. I gave it um, three stars, three and a half stars actually. It was it was very much a psychological story. Um, there was not a lot of action. It was a lot of conversations and a lot of flashbacks of conversations. But I felt that it was written in such an interesting way that the characters felt pretty fleshed out. Um, I will say of the writing style, uh, this guy, the, the male character, is a dude. Like, there's no other way to put it. He is 100% just a dude. Um, he, all of his thoughts are assessing the attractiveness and availability of the women that he meets. Um, he is kind of obsessed with himself kind of narcissistic uh he's unlikable y he's not so unlikable that you hate it you don't want to read it you want to put the book down um but reading it i'm like can can we flip to her perspective for a little bit because i need a break from the frat boy kind of mentality um but it also fits with the character. It was done for a purpose, and so it made it a lot more palatable in that way. Uh, I really cannot talk about 
any of the other elements of this book without kind of spoiling it and I don't want to spoil it um, the reason that I picked it up is it came up in one of my um, hey you might like this feeds and I don't remember from what platform um, but when I read the synopsis I was like first of all that sounds interesting second of all didn't I see a commercial for this with Chris Pine and um, and that actress that I can't think of her name I will google it and put it up here and yes that is that is what this is based off of and I would recommend it um honestly I feel like the show is probably going to be more interesting to a wider range of people the book can kind of be a slow burn because that is all you're doing is listening to a dialogue of two people meeting up after not having seen each other for many years and then flashbacks to other conversations when that's done in a film format it can be easier to build tension you're able to hear the inflections and the voices and see the expressions and the micro body movements and then you get the soundtrack in the background that helps to build the moment for whatever emotion they're trying to evoke from you so it was a very interesting book i'm kind of curious to actually see the show now i usually don't care i'm not that much of like a, i need to see the film or i need to see the the um, tv adaptation in this instance, I'm actually really interested. So that is All the Old Knives by Olin Steinhauer. That one I would say so far, of the ones that I've read, probably the most interesting to the widest range of audience. So I would suggest you check it out. Um, okay, I'm gonna lump in my Agatha Christie's together because I did get uh, two, three, four, no, three, I can count three Agatha Christie novels, um, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, which I think is the very first Hercule Poirot book. Um, I also read The Mystery of Three Quarters, which is I think the third Hercule Poirot story. And then I read, um, wait, no, there's just two. I see why I'm confused. It is just two. Yeah, The Mystery uh, Affair at Styles, which is Agatha Christie's first Hercule Poirot. And then there's The Mystery of Three Quarters, which I did not realize until after I'd read it. Her characters are in this book. She did not write this book. This was written by Sophie Hanna. So I don't know, I don't know if she purchased or the publisher purchased the intellectual property. I don't know if it became public domain. Um, but it is not Agatha Christie, but Agatha Christie's name is the biggest thing on the book cover and it's because of it's her characters and her world. Um, of the two, honestly, the second was more interesting. The Affair at Styles. I was kind of distracted while I was listening to it, so I don't think I really got the full experience. I still gave it three stars though. It, it was a good mystery. Again, it's a mystery. I, I can't really talk about it too much without spoiling stuff. Um, but The Mystery of Three Quarters, written by Sophie Hanna, it felt different the entire time I was listening to it and not realizing it was not actually written by Agatha Christie. And I was like, there's something off about this. It's so weird to me. It was, it was close in that it followed Hercule Poirot as far as his methodology, but the way that he spoke was very different. In this book, he was far more concerned with the emotional well-being of people and the emotional um, motivations of people, but he was not as intense in his methodology of going about solving the crime and using their emotional makeup and their emotional um, psyche as their motivation. So the whole time I'm like, this is like a softer Poirot, like he's he's more concerned about the people than he is concerned about solving the case. And then when I finished it and actually read a little bit more about the story, I was like, oh, it's a different author continuing this character, which is why it felt so different. It wasn't bad different. Like, I think he was very well written. Um, he was more likable as far as like a personable um, detective. But if you're looking for true blue Agatha Christie, the stereotypical Hercule Poirot, this this might get close, but it's going to be a little bit off target for you. Um, okay, then I'm going to lump the next three together as well. We have from C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Horse and His Boy, and Prince Caspian. 
Um, so last month I read The Magician's Nephew, which was the first in the Chronicles of Narnia series. Um, I believe it's, I don't know if it was written first, but it's like the precursor to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, so I rated each of these four stars. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was my favorite. I think it's the most well-written. I think it's the most epic in terms of storyline um, because it is a middle grade. It is a very condensed epic fantasy story. Um, I would love if it was, you know, an incredibly long series, uh, but that wasn't the audience that he was writing for. But I still really, really enjoy his writing. Um, it's very on point. It's very on the nose. But considering his audience, I think it's well done. Uh, the horse and his boy is set in the world of Narnia and it crosses the paths of some of the characters from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but it is about a different group of characters. And it is them trying to get to Narnia. They're in a neighboring land. And then Prince Caspian is many years, I think over a hundred years of Narnia time has passed and the rightful heir to the Narnian throne, there was a, an invasion of humans basically from another land and they took over Narnia. And so the animals that had been um, the main inhabitants of the land, those that can talk and that are sentient, um, have sort of been forced into the background uh, and out of most of Narnia as the humans took over. And now from that lineage, the current rightful heir to the throne um, believes the old stories of Narnia, believes that there are animals that are sentient and who can speak and just a very kind person, um, doesn't really want the throne, doesn't realize that he's the rightful heir to the throne, but he wants Narnia to be as it was. And so um, he manages to call back the siblings who were the original kings and queens of Narnia and ask for their assistance to get rid of this human infection in the land of Narnia. And he is, you know, not looking to be established as king, but looking to restore Narnia to its rightful inhabitants, those who are part of the land. Um, so again, each of these, I had a four star. I think probably Prince Caspian is my second favorite and the boy, the horse and his boy um, would be my least favorite, but still a great story. So I believe I only have one left. Voyage of the Dawn Treader is next. I don't remember if there's one after that or not. I think there is, I think there might be another. Um, I will probably finish those sometime in 2023. Um, okay, so then I read Sula by Toni Morrison. So this is my very first Toni Morrison book. Um, I had wanted to start with Beloved. And then as I read about the book, I read that it was kind of written a stream of consciousness. That is not my thing. I don't process those writings well. Um, it is not a criticism of any author who writes their story in that way. It is a criticism of my gerbil brain and its inability uh, and resistance to process and enjoy stories written in that manner. So um, I was reading up on different Toni Morrison novels, trying to find something that uh, I would connect with and so I picked Sula and I actually have a physical copy. I should grab it Considering this was the only physical book that I read I actually get to hold this one up So this is Sula and it's gorgeous first of all um, what's really cool is um, on the spines for uh, these stories from Toni Morrison when you find them in the bookstore they are set um, you can buy them in sets or they're set next to each other where the spines are all um, similar to this with a singular colored cover with a singular colored font and um, they make a really pretty spine lineup on the bookshelf so um, rather than go for the audiobooks on these because they are so short um, and the font on this is gigantic to me so this was an incredibly quick read. It's a very short story. Um, I'm gonna be getting more of Toni Morrison's work and I'm gonna try to get them in this edition so that on my bookshelf they can sit next to each other and make that intentional uh, design on my bookshelf. The story was beautifully written. Um, the prose in it reminds me of Arundhati Roy's The God of Small Things. 
the stories are not similar, the characters are not similar, but the way that the author uses words felt similar. They're both beautiful, they're both lyrical, they're both just so evocative of emotion and imagery and just masterfully done. So the story of Sula is actually the story of Sula and Danelle. They're two best friends um, growing up in a poor town in Ohio, in the town of Medallion. And Sula and Nell go their separate ways when Nell gets married. And Sula comes back to the town, I think after 10 years of just nobody's heard from her. And so the first part of the novel is them growing up and then the rest of it is the effects of Sula on the town when she comes back and the effects of the town on Sula. And it really focuses on the relationship between Sula and Nell. Um, it, there's a betrayal that happens between the two that, you know, irrevo irrevocably changes their relationship and the discussion of can something like that be reconciled it talks very very much about not only the black experience but the female black experience in so ohio in the united states is not considered a southern town it's considered the midwest but Just because it's up north doesn't mean that racism didn't exist. Just because blacks were not actively enslaved doesn't mean that they were not systematically oppressed. And so rather than being um, a discussion about, you know, active slavery, this is a discussion about how black people were able to move through the world in that time and if they were able to move through the world in that time and what that meant. Um, so medallion is specifically, there's a black section of medallion and they call it bottom, but it's actually at the top of a hill because the better land supposedly was at the bottom of the hill, which white people took because of course, um, but to market it as acceptable or better than it was, they call it the top of the hill bottom. And that is where they pushed the black community as far as the only land that they were able to own and work in themselves. Um, so it's really, really interesting. And one thing that I really liked about the story is that it didn't talk about white characters. There was no singular white character in this book. It didn't talk about racism as far as how whites treated blacks, how a specific person was being racist to a specific person in this. Instead, because I feel like that can get too granular for certain conversations with certain types of people who do, don't want to have those conversations in good faith. Instead, it talked about how blacks live through the systemic oppression, what that systemic racism and structure felt like. They're trying to build a road through the town and then they're trying to build a tunnel in the, the to go under the river um, of the town and how the black men in the community wanted desperately to be part of that construction project. They wanted to work with their hands. They wanted to to look at the town and say, I built part of that and how even that was denied them. It was given to whites, it was given to foreign whites, to white immigrants, because the, again, that white systemic oppression didn't want them to have their hands in part of constructing this, this permanent piece of the town. And it talks about all of that, specifically through the story of these two female friends who grew up together and then as adults had a betrayal that they had to reckon with their motivations and in in the actions that they're taking in their life and Sula specifically is the black sheep of the community um, she's considered an outcast she wants she doesn't want to not be an outcast she doesn't care what people think of her um, she lives kind of wild and free and the town demonizes her because of that and so it's a really beautiful discussion of so many intersections of things in here and I absolutely loved it I can't wait to read more from Toni Morrison eventually I probably will get to Beloved um, it, it does scare me because of the writing style but 
Um, I definitely want to get to it, so I'm going to try to build up to it. I'm going to be reading either The Song of Solomon or Tar Baby, um, maybe The Bluest Eye. Um, I think The Bluest Eye might also be Stream of Conscious. I have to check. So I'm going to try to build up to finally reading Beloved. Um, but yeah, I really love this. I gave this four stars. Um, I wish it was longer. I really do. Um, I, I love that it's it's kind of a vignette, um, but I always want more when there's such beautiful writing and such incredible storytelling um, that Toni Morrison could pull from this. Um, so yeah, that was Sula. Okay, three to go. Man, this I gotta I gotta edit this now. This is too long. Um, okay, so this, the next one that I read was Nordic Tales, folk tales from Norway, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, and Denmark. So this is literally just a story collection of fairy tales from the Nordic areas, um, kind of like a Brothers Grimm, where they had collected fairy tales from around Europe and combined them and published them. So this is a published retelling of folk tales that have been passed down in those areas. Four stars, absolutely loved it. Um, I would recommend the audiobook because they actually had, I think, three different narrators reading the stories. Um, they had uh, some, that kind of accent of some of the Nordic regions. So the names were pronounced correctly. The story was, it sounded like you're being read, you know, orally told the fairy tale and that's how those things were passed through generations. But what was really cool about it was, one, the stories were really interesting. There were two, at least, at least two that jumped out at me as familiar fairy tales that I have heard from, I want to say from the Brothers Grimm collection, but these are their Nordic counterparts. So I'm kind of interested to learn, were these the originals? And then the Brothers Grimm stories that I'm used to were kind of adopted and changed. Um, you know, where did, it, and that, they, that may be a question that can never be answered. It's hard to tell with some of these oral traditions. Um, but the first one that came to my mind is, um, it's called the Mighty Miko. It's Puss in Boots, but with a fox instead of a cat. Loved it. I got so excited where I'm like, wait, is this going to be Puss in Boots? And then I get into the story. I'm like, this is totally Puss in Boots. Um, and then the second one is, I know it as Stone Soup. In the Nordic version, it is Nail Soup. There's a rusty iron nail that's used instead of a stone. Um, so just having a familiarity, knowing I had forgotten about some of these stories, honestly. Um, but when I was listening to it being, you know, being reta rec recounted, retold, I was like, oh, wait, I know this. I know this. So I, I absolutely loved it. It was a very fast read, very entertaining. I would highly recommend the audiobook for this. I feel like that's the perfect way to experience folklores and fairy tales. Okay, my second to last book is The House Across the Lake by Riley Sager. I know that this is kind of a hot take or a hot topic. So the book, you either love it or hate it. A lot of people hate it. Um, I did watch one YouTuber who was doing an experiment video of reading like BookTube's most hated book. Um, so they read this and really loved it. I did not let myself get spoiled. I decided to go ahead and read it for myself and I kind of land square in the middle. I thought the writing was decent. Um, I thought the character, the main character who kind of sees things happen across the lake and starts to become suspicious of some foul doings, um, she is an alcoholic and I appreciated the way that this character was written. This is a weird thing to focus on in a thriller, but I appreciated that alcohol dependency was not glamorized and it was not minimized. It is a big part of the story. Um, it calls into question her memories. It calls into question her testimonies about things because is she a reliable narrator if she is constantly under the influence of alcohol? And it also talks about the ugly side of alcoholism. And a lot of books don't do this. They kind of make a joke of it. And having known people in my life who were absolutely alcohol dependent it is not funny it is not amusing it is not glamorous it is dangerous it is ugly it is hurtful it is harmful so to see it represented more authentically and accurately was incredibly 
important for me and I really appreciated that from this author and I think that's part of why I rated it as highly as I did um, because the twist there are multiple twists in the book first of all but the twist in this book the main twist I didn't care for I get it it's a choice I didn't like it um, and it's not that I didn't like the twist it's that to me it changes the book that you're reading and I really can't talk about it more than that because it would very very much spoil the book um, but I feel like the book sells itself a little deceptively and that's what I didn't like about it. So I definitely knocked off two stars for that. Um, some of the dialogue was a bit stilted. I absolutely love the references though to Rear Window because yes, this is basically like a modern Rear Window scenario um, up, to a, up to a point and so like the, the main character totally calls it. She's an actress. Um, she's a theater actress, but uh, she is like, uh, like I'm Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window right now. I am spying the heck out of my neighbors. And I just, I love that it addressed it. And I love the way that it did it. Was it a decent mystery? Yes. Did the plot twists, like, were they very twisty? Like, I didn't expect it? Yes. Um, so for the most part, I thought, I thought the writing was decent. Um, but its characterizations of people were really what struck me. The twists were well done. I just didn't, I didn't like them in this book. If you read it yourself, you'll understand. But so I'm going to say three stars for The House on the Lake. And then the book that I finally finished at like 11.30, 11.45 on December 31st was Becoming Madame Mao by Anne Chi Min. So this is similar to The Devil in the White City. This is a fictionalized imagining of obviously a very real person. This was um, Qian Jing, Qian Jing um, Madame Mao, basically Mao Zedong's wife. And, well, second wife? Third wife? Anyway, the wife that was married to Mao when he became Mao. So this is based off of letters and diaries and documents of the time. And then it takes the facts of the case and it writes them in third person. To, to kind of delineate this is something that was known to have happened and then it flips to first person where it gets into the fictionalized reimagining of what she might have gone through that related to this exact experience and so you flip back and forth almost sometimes paragraph to paragraph um, between third and first person it took a little bit getting used to but i actually enjoyed the writing style after a while and i also kind of appreciated it in that i felt like i was understanding what was historical and what was fictionalized as a result and i do appreciate that i only gave the book three stars um it it kind of dragged i've read other works by Anne Min. i actually really like her as an author her other writings are historical fiction and based on historical figures and things um this is the first one that i think was supposed to be more history than fiction is the way that I felt that it was trying to be written as. Um, but it did kind of drag and it was one of those books that I, I don't know if it's because it was an ebook format or if it was the story itself that I kept putting down and picking up and putting down and picking up. It took me over months to read it. Um, but I still enjoyed it. And if uh, Chinese history, if the communist revolution, if Mao Zedong or Chiang Jing are topics that interest you, I would recommend picking it up because it kind of, if you're, if you don't want to pick up a, a history book or, you know, read simply the big historical, you know, works that talk about what exactly was known, if you want to kind of ease into it with a little bit of a fictionalized imagining of the people that were going through these things, this would, this might be a decent, um, a decent starting point. So the book starts with her, the eve of her execution, and then it kind of goes her, it's her memories of her childhood, and then, you know, all the way up to how she became Madame Mao and what that meant for her and trying to collect and solidify her power, knowing that Mao Zedong was not immortal. He's not going to last forever. And what does that mean for her? Um, at times she was Mao's lover, at times she was his enemy, at times she was his confidant, at times she was his, um, you know, his, his hand, his reaching out hand in, in getting um, the cultural revolution started and getting people to become more involved as an ideology other than just the army itself. So 
it was a decent read. Um, it was not very long, but it wasn't enough to kind of keep me super, super involved. So it took me a while to get through. But I would say if you're interested in any of those topics, check out um, Becoming Madame Mao by Anne Chi Min. <sighs> That's it. Those are my books for December. It was a lot of books. I got to find a way to cut these down. I talk way too much, but that's why I have this channel is because this is the only place I get to talk about books. Um, otherwise the people in my life, I are just bored to tears talking to me. So thank you guys so much for joining me. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you liked for this, this December, or even just for 2022. What were the best things that you read? Um, what were your least favorite reads? Have you read any of the books that I read in December? Let me know. Um, if you can hit that like button, I, I'm, I have a goal to get this video to five likes. That may sound pathetic, but you know what? I'm just starting out and I would love to see if I can get five people who enjoy the content enough to leave me a like and let me know in the comments below if there's anything that you think I should change about my formats. Um, I'm going to be doing a 2023 goals video and it'll be reading goals and channel goals. Um, so I will encourage people, especially there to kind of give me their feedback. What do they think? Probably that I make videos that are too long and I talk too much or I talk too fast. Um, we'll see what people say. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just out here trying to share my love of books with another, with a whole community that loves talking about books. So I'm, I'm still so happy to be here. Um, so yeah, I will be making my 2023 goals video. I will be making my 2022 wrap up. I kind of want to do a year in review. I'm not going to review every book I read because that would be like eight hours long. Um, and I have, um, a whole series of videos that I'm starting to kind of get in the planning stages for that. I'm really excited for 2023. I'm trying to branch out from some of the typical booktube format of things. Um, I tried to do the vlogs and I don't lead an interesting enough life and it, the filming and the editing became way too much for me to handle. Um, I love doing wrap ups. Um, I'm still going to be doing book hauls, book hauls, book hauls, book hauls, Lauren book hauls, um, book hauls. Um, and you know, but I'm, I'm trying to find my own voice and niche in this channel and I'm starting to kind of have ideas of what that might look like. So I'm really excited about 2023. I just set my new reading goals and I have an entire 23, 2023 TBR that I think I'm also going to be doing a video on. So thank you so much, you guys, for coming along with me on the very start of this journey through 2022. And I cannot wait to continue this journey with you in 2023. Take care of yourselves. Hydrate, please hydrate. Water is so important. Take care of yourselves, keep reading, be kind to each other, and I will see you next time.